Well, hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Beaver Lake Watershed Annual Symposium. We're so glad you all could be here today, and we're looking forward to a really great program this morning. Um, we really do miss having this program in person this year, but we are really excited that we are able to do this live. So thanks for being here this morning. So I'm Becky Rowark. I'm the Alliance Executive Director. And for those of you just joining, uh, we have a really great program today. So I'm going to start off a little bit about the Beaver Watershed Alliance and our work in the region. And then we're going to move along to a really great lineup of guest speakers today with perspectives from both the state and the local levels. So Beaver Lake and its tributaries are interconnected with our regional landscape in Northwest Arkansas. So landowners, universities, scientists, government agencies, utilities, conservation organizations, and water quality groups are all working in collaboration to achieve conservation objectives. So this annual symposium uh, aims to bring educational awareness on technical topics, highlight the efforts and results achieved in the Beaver Lake watershed, but also open a space for dialogue. So throughout the program this morning, um, you're going to have an opportunity to engage with our guest speakers. Um, the best way to do that is to use the Q&A box on your screen. So those will pop up and we can answer those questions during our presentations or afterwards. Um, and also, Carrie Byron, our outreach coordinator, is going to be asking, um, maybe asking some questions through a poll um, or typing things in the chat. And she'll also be announcing winners for our giveaways today in the chat. So do keep an eye on that as well. Um, but we really want you to um, feel free to ask questions and engage for today's program. So uh, we want to thank our many partners, Alliance Board of Directors and the Alliance staff for making this program possible. Okay, so a little bit about the Beaver Lake watershed area, uh, or I'm sorry about us. So our mission is to proactively protect, enhance and sustain the water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. And we do that through education and outreach. We do technical assistance with landowners and cities and counties and help implement voluntary best management practices. Um, we also conduct scientific monitoring and research for the Beaver Lake watershed. And just to give you a little context, um, so this right, Arkansas and the Beaver Lake watershed are located within the Mississippi-Missouri drainage basin, um, and that all drains down to the Gulf of Mexico. And to zoom in a little, uh, the White River watershed covers portions of Arkansas and Missouri, and that all drains over to the Mississippi River. And the Beaver Lake watershed is, and Beaver Lake is actually the first of three impoundments along the White, the White River system. So we're in the very headwaters um, of this, of the White River watershed. So if we zoom in just a little more, um, here's the Beaver Lake watershed. And this covers two ecoregions. We have the Boston Mountains and the Ozark Highland regions within this watershed area. And it's also uh, crosses many jurisdictions, uh, 17 municipal municipal municipalities and six counties. Um, and Beaver Dam uh, was built back in the 1960s for water supply, flood control, and hydroelectric generation. Um, this is also a water supply for half a million people in Arkansas, and that water supply goes all the way from Harrison, Arkansas, to the Oklahoma border. So some of our key landscape features within this watershed, um, it's mostly forested, uh, and then about 21% pasture, but we also have really steep slopes, springs, and a karst geology. We also have over 2,800 miles of rivers, creeks, and streams in the Beaver Lake watershed area, and those are home to some smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, mussels, darters, and many micro and 
uh, macro invertebrates that depend on good water quality. So Beaver Lake um, itself has four main intakes for water supply. And um, this lake itself is, uh, produces over 172 million kilowatts of, of electricity. And it brings in almost $130 million in recreation and tourism. So it's a really um, big part of the Northwest Arkansas growth. And so we really um, need to take care of this precious resource. So we work to advance the Beaver Lake Watershed Protection Strategy. Uh, this is a nine element EPA plan for watershed management. This plan was initiated back in 2009 with revisions in 2012. So we're currently updating this for 2021, but this pretty much lays out our goals um, to help protect and manage the Beaver Lake watershed. So you'll see here on the screen, um, this, uh, the challenges that we've identified are um, sediment. It is the number one pollutant here in the Beaver Lake watershed area. So we're focusing a lot of our efforts over in the West Fork watershed, the Lower White, and around the lakeside. And a lot of that sediment's coming from stream bank erosion, like you see here along banks. Channel erosion is the biggest contributor. Um, but there's also sediment coming off of dirt roads, um, as well as construction site runoff and development. So nearly one ton of um, sediment is pulled from lake water by water suppliers each day. So another challenge that we have is a rapid growing population. So Northwest Arkansas is growing at a rate of about 32 people per day. And our population as of 2020 is around 500 18,000 residents, and uh, it's projected to be double that by 2045. So more people coming in, there's more impervious surfaces, uh, more pressures on our infrastructure, and so um, we need to be thinking about how to manage water um, and water quality um, as we grow. Um, another challenge that we have here in this particular watershed is flooding. So we used to have, uh, Northwest Arkansas receives, we get about 48 inches of rain per year. And we used to see three inches over a day of rain, but now we're getting three inches in an hour or less. So it's uh, really putting a lot of pressure on our urban areas, um, but also out in our rural areas too. As we lose some of that riparian area, um, and trees and things, it's causing a lot of the stream bank erosion as well. So, so this is a, a something we do is we help monitor some of this erosion <clears throat> and we're seeing a lot of land loss happening along some of our main tributaries. So as you see here, um, this is a landowner on the War Eagle and um, just within a year, lost nearly an acre of land. And on other stretches in Washington County, we've seen up to five acres of land loss happening um, from channel erosion. So the Alliance, we're working to address um, these challenges. And again, doing that through education and outreach, technical assistance and best management practices, but also uh, scientific research and monitoring. So I just wanna share some of the ways that, that we're addressing that. Um, we do have a really broad reach. We have a watershed news mailer that goes out to over 22,000 landowners along creeks, streams, um, pastures, and forests. We have a monthly e-news that goes out um, as well as a Facebook and a YouTube channel um, so we try to cover all the bases for outreach. Um, we also have a quarterly speaker series and we cover topics ranging from um, nutrient reduction strategies to um, the geology of the Beaver Lake watershed, the weather patterns, um, all sorts of topics that we feel uh, are important to just stay up to date and informed on. Uh, we also go out and do speaking events, tabling, and then we also hold BMP workshops and youth programs. 
And here's a photo of um, some of the farm tours and BMP workshops that we do. Um, right now, we're still we're still doing these in small groups. Um, however, we do look forward to getting back and doing these at full capacity because this is one of the best ways to share um, education is this farmer to farmer engagement. Um, so these are really important and we continue to do these very successfully. And we also get out and help people plant trees, native plants, along riparian areas. Um, this was along Bunch Park in Elkins, helping a city um, get a riparian uh, established. We do erosion estimates with the Watershed Conservation Resource Center. We're out measuring stream banks, uh, working with landowners on identifying their challenges and goals. Um, but also helping to analyze the sediment and nutrient loads going into uh, main tributaries into Beaver Lake. Um, and once we uh, have that information and data, uh, we can work with partners to help find funding to um, do river restorations like you see here. Uh, this is the Watershed Conservation Resource Center. Um, they just finished a, a natural channel design a river restoration over on Rock Creek, which is just downstream from the pond project that you're gonna to see today. Um, low water crossings have also been an up and coming topic. Uh, we're seeing more, more landers are reaching out to us uh, to address low water crossings and dirt road management, things like that. So uh, we are out providing technical assistance and there are programs that we do promote to help landowners um, to take advantage of the funding or cost share programs to help uh, restore or correct these issues. So this was a project out at Mill Creek, which is on the headwaters of the Beaver Lake watershed. Uh, this was a low water crossing removal um, and it helped to connect, to reconnect 24 miles of stream. Uh, pasture aeration is another program. We're helping farmers to um, aerate their pasture lands, which can increase yields up to 30%. And um, a big part of what we do is to just help landowners have site assessments. So we're going out and you know, taking a look at their property, offering recommendations, but we would also help provide a visual assessment so that they can see um, their goals kind of laid out on paper uh, to help them get to a moment of action. Um, these are just a number of scientific monitoring things we do for this watershed. Uh, pond sampling, we help with uh, SECI measurements. We're a stream smart participant, um, a number of things here. And some of our current initiatives include, um, uh, we are working with several partners and we're the lead outreach for the uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And that's focused on the West Fork of the White River watershed. And over $8.4 million has come into this project. Um, so this is the most amount of money that has came to one single project here in this watershed. So we appreciate all of our partners for this. Uh, we also have a project with the uh, Department of Natural Resources to install three green infrastructure projects over half a million dollars going towards that. And um, also an initiative for this pond optimization project that you're gonna hear about later today with Dr. Thad Scott and uh, Dr. Haggard. So altogether, it takes a lot of partners to get these things done. So we appreciate everybody that we work with and appreciate all of our speakers today. And of course, all of you all for being here this morning as well. So, <clears throat> okay, so um, usually we get to do this in person, but um, we give out a Watershed Guardian Award each year um, to an individual group or others that demonstrate leadership in water quality. Um, and this year's recipient was Barbara Taylor. Barbara Taylor helped to advance the mission of the Beaver Lake watershed since its inception in 2011. And Barbara also helped to establish our awareness and education committee for the Alliance. 
Um, she chaired that committee from 2011 to 2020. Um, and she also served as treasurer. Uh, Barbara also served on the Washington County Quorum Court and led public education projects for the League of Women Voters um, and the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. So she's done a number of things and uh, we were happy to present her with this year's uh, Watershed Guardian Award. So we wanna congratulate Barbara Taylor. Okay, so that's it on my end and so now let's switch over here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, so our first speakers this morning are um, from a state perspective and we have uh, Bregan Anderson, Ryan Benefield, and Edgar Mercyofsky. And I just wanted to uh, introduce them and then we'll turn it over to you all. So um, Ryan is the deputy director for the USDA Department of Ag Natural Resources. And uh, Bregan Anderson is an ecologist coordinator uh, also for DNR. And Edgar is our state soil scientist for the USDA NRCS. So um, we really appreciate y'all being here this morning to offer a state level perspective. And um, uh, Ryan and Brigan, I'll turn it over to you all. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And can you all see that okay? Okay. All right, so I appreciate the introduction, Becky, um, and we appreciate the Beaver Watershed Alliance inviting us to talk to you guys about some of the ongoing updates we have with the nutrient reduction strategy and also introducing a septic tank remediation program. So I wanted to start off with some beef, like some brief background about the Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force, which Arkansas is a member of and has been a member of since 1998. So the hypoxia task force was established in the late 1990s to understand the causes and effects of nutrient enrichment on the Gulf of Mexico. And currently the hypoxia task force has 12 member states, including us, five federal members, which include the EPA, NRCS, NOAA, USGS, and the Corps of Engineers, and also it, the National Tribal Water Council. And there is also a great working partnership with land grant universities throughout the basin including the University of Arkansas's Cooperative Extension Service. In 2008, the Gulf Hypoxia Action Plan uh, was published by the EPA and federal partners and it adopted these goals for the basin. And some of those include reducing the loss of nitrogen and phosphorus 45% and also trying to reduce the five-year running average of the Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone by 2035. We are quickly approaching an interim target to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loading 20% by 2025. And so this 2008 action plan is actually what called for states to complete and implement comprehensive nitrogen and phosphorus reduction strategies. And within this action plan, the EPA and their partners acknowledged that a single approach to nutrient reduction wouldn't be effective because states within the basin have different soils, hydrology, land use, and cropping systems, and there's also different administrative frameworks in place to address water quality concerns in each state. And here in Arkansas, we acknowledge that we do contribute to ongoing water quality concerns. And for the development of our strategy, it was initiated by that action plan and also the Arkansas Water Plan. The final strategy was released in 2014, and it is intended for state and federal agencies with the authority to develop and implement nutrient reduction plans and practices, but also for local agencies and organizations with a mission for environmental and water quality protection. So the nutrient reduction strategy is a voluntary document. It, it does not supersede any water laws governing water quality here in Arkansas. It's meant to be an action-based program to help us reduce the impact of nitrogen and phosphorus on our surface waters. 
but it allows us to compile strategies to address both point and non-point sources of nutrients. And it helps us identify a method to show meaningful and measurable progress. And for this strategy, it's meant to help promote existing and new innovative best management practices, technologies, and support research ongoing in the state. However, there have been some issues identified with the current strategy, those being it lacks a clearly defined goal, there's no presentation for a strategy for future work or an action plan, uh, no method to evaluate progress, and we're currently targeting watersheds based on where work is already being done and not necessarily on in-stream nutrient concentrations or loads. And we have yet to be successful in adequately showing that resources expended has resulted in a documentable positive effect on in-stream water quality. We have a number of ongoing updates to address these deficiencies and these issues with the strategy. Uh, the primary one being the update and review of the strategy. And we are also working with the Arkansas Water Resources Center, Dr. Brian Haggard and his team to assess water quality trends in Huck 8 watersheds and how to go about prioritizing those watersheds based on site specific characteristics. We're also in the initiation phase of developing a tool to track non-point source implementation efforts and estimating the, co the coordinating nutrient reduction efficiencies of those practices or practice suites. And then as Ryan will later be talking about is uh, piloting a septic tank remediation program. So in the revised strategy, it is, will include our management goals and our strategic framework for action. So those being our goals, our objectives and strategies to go about implementing nutrient reduction activities. It will include our newly prioritized watersheds. It will continue to highlight state and federal programs supporting nutrient reduction activities. And examples of those include our non-point source management program here at the Natural Resources Division, uh, the USDA NRCS Farm Bill programs and landscape initiatives, and also programs like the Discovery Farms. We will continue to promote our collaboration and partner efforts for ongoing activities throughout the state it will establish some reporting metrics and timelines and also outline our methodology for continuing to evaluate the strategy and its effectiveness. And we will be taking an adaptive management approach to do so. And briefly, I wanted to describe our method methodology for assessing water quality trends. So AWRC will be helping us look at the directional change of the 75th percentile of all total nitrogen and total phosphorus concentration data within each eight digit huck. And from that analysis, we'll hopefully be able to categorize based on site specific trends using ambient monitoring data used from uh, collected by the Division of Environmental Quality and available flow data. And we'll have four categories. We'll have our highest priority watersheds or our nutrient reduction focused watersheds. We'll have two categories for insufficient data. So one being high priority and one being low. And then also our lowest priority watersheds, which will show decreasing trends in nutrient concentrations. And we also have our non-point source measurement framework. This was actually initiated back in 2018 and a group of technical stakeholders got together to identify core practices and practice suites used throughout the state uh, to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus inputs to our receiving waters. And here I have some of our ex practice suites that were identified by this, by this group of stakeholders and those include irrigation water management practices, tailwater recovery, irrigation water use practices, row crop soil nutrient management, conservation tillage, and pasture management practices. They also identified their expected nutrient reduction efficiencies for those associated practices. And that will hopefully, this tool will help us track and quantify some of those nutrient reduction. And they also identified some management practices which are needing further research and those include practices like a pipe planner, or they're used widely throughout the state, but um, more research is needed. So pipe planner, two-stage ditches, and um, some other pasture management practices. 
And now I will turn it over to Ryan to talk about more about our subject remediation program. All right. Thanks, Brigham. Um, first, I want to start out by just bragging on Brigham. So she's taking our nutrient reduction strategy. She's going big places with it. If you haven't engaged her on our nutrient reduction strategy, I encourage you to reach out to her and get involved. Uh, we're making big progress uh, over the last six months. And in the next couple of years, you're going to see a, a great new framework for how we're going to address nutrients in the state. Um, so I am Ryan Benefield. I'm the Deputy Director at the Natural Resources Division, now in the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. Um, most of you have dealt with us at Natural Resources in one way or the other. Uh, you probably have a very limited view. Most people either deal with us on 319 projects or they deal with us on uh, the nutrient reduction strategy or our conservation district work. But I will tell you one of the biggest things we do at Natural Resources is actually loan and grant money to water and wastewater systems across the state. So I pulled up our statistics for last year. Uh, we actually loaned or granted out over $100 million last year. We've got over a billion dollar in loan per portfolio. Uh, and I think, uh, I say this without having the actual statistics, but I, I think it's pretty true that we're the largest financer of water and wastewater projects in the state. I can't imagine anyone having a larger portfolio than we do. Um, with that, the one area we had not previously addressed was septic tanks. So if you've worked with natural resources in the past, you know one thing about us and that our programs are primarily voluntary incentive-based programs. So uh, the Department of Health is the regulatory agency over septic systems, but we're able to use some of our loan and grant dollars to uh, promote uh, the replacement of inadequate or poorly maintained septic systems. So we've been working on a program for a couple of years, we want to put it as part of our nutrient reduction strategy as a main, a main tool in our toolbox. And we're so happy to be able to announce that we recently got to the point where we can implement that program. And it's particularly exciting to be on this call because uh, the Beaver Reservoir watershed or the entire Upper White actually is included as one of our first watersheds we're going to implement this program in. So uh, you may be asking why we're doing it. Probably not, um, you know, septic tanks. Uh, throughout Arkansas are, are used widely and, and actually it's a good thing. You're never going to hear me say a bad thing about septic tanks. There's parts of the state where it's the very best way of handling um, municipal sewage. Um, however, if they're not maintained, they can be ineffective and pose a, a water quality hazard. And whereas we're really good about identifying where municipal systems, uh, you know, a, a municipal waste or treatment plant may be failing or not meeting its, uh, its intended uh, design. We're really, you know, septic tanks are a lot harder to address. So, uh, so what we wanted to do is provide a financial incentive for homeowners in some targeted watersheds to replace their old failing tanks. So one thing it won't do, it will not give a loan or grant for someone to put a brand new one in. Our thoughts on that is if you're building a new home, putting in your septic tank is part of uh, of your cost of putting the home in. But where we have some existing ones, we wanna provide some financial incentives. So we picked three watersheds to pilot this in. Um, one, the Beaver Reservoir watershed, or like I said, that's really the entire upper white eight digit huck. The Illinois River watershed, for obvious reasons with our longstanding uh, work we're doing with Oklahoma on their phosphorus reduction standard. And then we also are wanting to target it in the Buffalo River watershed based its overall value to the state of Arkansas and importance to the state. Um, so how we're gonna do it, we're gonna partner with an organization in each of the watersheds. And uh, um, we've already, uh, the Illinois River Watershed Partnership has uh, already received a grant to do it in the Illinois. Uh, we're gonna work with Ozark Water Watch. They received a grant to do it in the Upper White. Uh, and uh, it's gonna be a three-year pilot. So we just approved the funding in September uh, we're hoping to have the program up and running no later than January 1, 2021. Uh, Illinois River Watershed Partnership and Ozark Water Watch are both on, on pace to do that. Uh, the Buffalo River Watershed, we have not identified that organization yet. Uh, we'll be working next year to get that one up and running. Uh, probably allowing the Beaver and the Illinois River ones to uh, get a little head start. And then we're just going to take what they're doing and, and multiply it over to the Buffalo Watershed. All right, Brian. All right, so how it's gonna work. So um, if someone has a failing septic tank, and so they're gonna be working with uh, 
with the local organization and in the Beaver watershed, it's going to be Ozark Water Watch. I think I saw Aaron Scott um, on in the in the list there. So she'll be work. We'll be working with Aaron. Um, It'll fund up to 30,000. Now we know that most septic tanks are hopefully gonna fall between the three and 7,000 range. But uh, working on, um, oh, I should have mentioned, Ozark Water Watch does a similar program around Table Rock Lake. So they have a lot of experience in running this program. It's why uh, you know we reached out to them early on to say, hey, can we do this uh, around Beaver? Uh, but they found that occasionally some areas uh, in the Ozarks need a more advanced system. And so that's why we went and said, okay, up to 30, but knowing that it's gonna be actual cost. And people have to get three quotes to make sure that uh, we get the uh, legitimate cost. Uh, like I said, it's repair or replacement of an existing system. Uh, we're gonna offer a grant or loan breakdown based on the, the household income of the applicant. So, uh, but, even if it's a loan, it's 10 years at 0% interest. So it's a highly subsidized loan, even for those folks who may uh, have the income necessary to, to qualify for a loan. But you can kind of see um, these uh, amounts weren't set randomly. The uh, median household income in Arkansas for the last census, the one we use is around 41.6. Uh, so you can kind of see if you're below half of the median household income for the state, you're at 90-10, 90% grant, 10% loan. Uh, and then if you're over double the median household income for the state of Arkansas, you're at 100% loan. And you can kind of see where it breaks down in between there with people at the median household income for the state being about a 50-50. But once again, even for those folks who are loan, it's still 10 years at 0% interest, all right? So what are we going to do? So we've we've given a grant uh, for Ozark Water Watch. It's around a uh, little over two one point two million dollars to uh, run start the program for a three year period. Uh, they will be working to, uh, to to implement it within the watershed. So they'll be determining homeowner eligibility and income status, uh, reviewing the applications, making sure they get all their invoices, get their quotes. Uh, attaining, uh, you know, a promissory note and filing deeds of trust, accepting loan installments until the loan is repaid, and then uh, releasing the 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 uh, lease the uh, uh, deeds uh, uh, for the homeowner. And then, so what's happened is we're given a grant of the million dollars to run the program, and and it'll come as this first set of septic tanks are replaced. But that money will come back to Ozark Water Watch, and then they'll be able to revolve it back out. Now, since some pe a lot of people are going to be getting a significant grant, obviously that, and we're getting zero percent interest, it's that principal is going to reduce as we revolve it. But uh, we're really excited about it, and I just wanted to note too: the million dollars is just a starting number. If they were to get enough cases into to our septic tanks to exceed that amount we're able and willing to put additional dollars in each of these water sets. So next. So what will the homeowner have to do? They'll have to hire a qualified, uh, you know, licensed designer, uh, and if needed, a soil scientist. They'll have to get three quotes. They'll have to meet all the regulatory requirements. Uh, you know, they'll have to do all the work, do the deed, you know, allow the deed of trust to be placed um, and all of the things. So really what it is for Ozark Water Watch is more an in-office exercise most of the work will be done by these installers. Uh, the um, one thing to note is, like I mentioned, this is a completely voluntary program. There is no regulatory piece to this. Uh, the only requirement uh, that's sort of regulatory is once a homeowner decides he wants to replace his septic tank, the health department will come out and verify that yes, it is a septic tank that would need to be replaced. We don't wanna be replacing septic tanks that obviously are functioning well. And so, but it's pretty, completely voluntary. We're excited about it. Um, one thing I will note is it is a pilot. So I'm gonna ask all y'all in the Beaver Watershed to, to help us. The more successful it is, the more we can take this same method and expand it to all the other watersheds uh, of the state, particularly ones that we identify as nutrient rich. So uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. We're excited, it's very timely. Uh, hopefully the first of the year, uh, we can start getting some septic tanks in and uh, see how the program is gonna work. All right, with that, I think we're done. Unless you, Becky, unless you want to take questions now, or uh, I apologize, I'm going to jump off here in a minute. We have the Arkansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas River Compact Commission meeting today. 
but if you uh, can't ask questions now, feel free to send Bregan or I a, an email and, uh, and we'll be sure to get back with you. Well, thank yeah. you, Ryan. <clears throat> thank you, Ryan Bregan, so much. We really appreciate um, your time this morning. And of course, we're happy to help support anything we can in the Beaver Lake watershed, so. All right, do you need me to go ahead and stop sharing? Um, so you can, and um, we did have a question uh, for you, Bregan, uh, if you have a moment to, to answer this. Um, okay. Has your team at any point ranked the BMPs in order of their nutrient removal efficiency? Uh, not at this point. That is, That will be the next step in that tool development process. Okay, thank you. And all right. So thank you, Bregan and Ryan for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you. So, um, uh, so yeah, Edgar, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen sure. and we'll get started with your presentation. Okay, hopefully you can see uh, the screen. Is that not, just not checking? Yet. Not yet. Okay, let me go back. Try this again. Well, it just worked perfectly this morning. It did, didn't it? <laughs> There we go, hopefully. All right, perfect. <clears throat> Very good. Uh, sorry about the little confusion. Um, I'm Edgar Merzioski. I'm with the USDA NRCS here in Arkansas, located in Little Rock. I, I'm, I serve as a tight soil scientist and uh, have been uh, one of the leads here for source water protection as it relates to the Farm Bill. Uh, you see my contact information there. And uh, today is just going to give you kind of a background of uh, uh, where this, uh, where we came from on the, uh, through the Farm Bill for source water protection, and then uh, where we are going with that. So, uh, go ahead with the next slide. So in the 2018 Farm Bills, uh, the language in there, uh, the Secretary of Ag uh, encouraged the protection of drinking water sources through uh, following methods, identify local priority areas uh, in the state. Uh, we, in working with state technical committees and community water systems, these may address water quality and quantity concerns. And um, through the Farm Bill, uh, provide increased incentives for practices, conservation practices that relate to water quality and quantity and protecting water sources while also benefiting uh, the producers. Uh, nationwide, uh, we're uh, looking at uh, in the Farm Bill, dedicating at least 10% of the total funds available for conservation programs with the exception of the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. Uh, each year beginning in uh, 2019 through 2023 uh, to be used uh, in the area of source water protection. Oops, went one side too many. So nationwide, uh, NRCS has been collaborating with the EPA offices of groundwater and drinking water. We've been doing that with Region 6 here uh, association uh, we've also been 
They've also been working with the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. Uh, we've been working with the Arkansas uh, Water Works Association um, uh, here locally and nationally, they're working with the American Water Works Association. So part of this is identifying state local priority areas, and this is kind of an example, but state conservations have, have worked with either the drinking water program of interest, uh, you know, utilities and that, and we've been going, working with that. We've worked with uh, the Arkansas Department of Health, especially Dar Darsha Roos uh, area in, in, in uh, looking at where, where some of these areas that we might want to consider. Um, and so, and we've been working uh, with utilities. Um, sizes of areas vary depending on whether it was a source water or groundwater source, um, uh, and by the size of population that serves. States have used, a, you know, around have used a variety of approaches in determining local priorities. So, when we started this, we looked at uh, source water protection areas uh, as designated by EPA. And so the purple area represents those uh, hucks that the uh, EPA had designated as source water uh, protection areas. Now they have been expanded. We did use um, uh, the Beaver watershed area and the central Arkansas water area, which is expanded from the EPA. The uh, goldish colored dots in areas like that, smaller areas, or areas where um, uh, groundwater wells are used. So those are protection areas around uh, wells that are used for municipal water usage. We also added in and looking at some of our past uh, projects, especially our RCPP projects that were dealing with water quality. Uh, during the same time period, the Arkansas Forestry and Drinking Water Group was looking at areas um, that they wanted to concentrate in for uh, projects. This was an expanded area. They have since uh, narrowed down to some, some hucks that they're going to work with. And then just to see where things are, what we've done in the past, uh, we looked at where are those water quality conservation practices at, you know, and so, so when we're selecting hucks, uh, where, where should we uh, look at to select those? And also water quantity. And so we looked at where those water quantity practices are. And, and those are more crop related. So they would definitely be in uh, uh, areas over in Eastern Arkansas, over in uh, that part of the state. Part of this also is um, with easements. And easements serve um, a great area for recharge for our uh, areas over in eastern Arkansas for our aquifers. So the area in purple is our area that we submitted initially as our water quality priority area. It's fairly large, but this was an area that we knew we were doing work in and that, that was, there was great interest in. The area in gold was our water quantity priority area. And uh, this was an area we, we selected that because anything within um, that area was either affecting the alluvial or the Sparta. Our idea was is that, hey, if we put more conservation out there or, or, or encourage the use of uh, maybe a, a above ground water in reservoirs and that keeping um, farmers outside of the um, uh, uh, outside of the Sparta uh, aquifer, which is a little bit deeper, but which is better quality for municipal purposes, uh, that would be a good thing. So, uh, but if you take a well out, then you're affecting the whole aquifer. So that's why we ch chose to use such a large area. Nationwide, uh, we were 
looking at similar areas uh, along, uh, uh, you know, within, uh, say, Texas, Louisiana, uh, Missouri, and going up through Iowa, that they were similar in size and, and stuff. We did not have a, a uh, size uh, limitation initially. And so we were looking at um, making sure that we were able to put good work everywhere that we could. So in the dedication of the 10% funds, uh, this would be tracked uh, uh, at, at national headquarters. Uh, but we're gonna track this here so that we're transparent. So we're gonna look at, also look at those uh, issues uh, or those uh, practices that we uh, put on the ground here in, in the state. So those include through uh, EQIP, CSP and RCPP, NWQI also. Uh, it also includes the, the uh, uh, easements program. And tracking will consider the type of systems, the surface versus groundwater and determine applicable contracts and practices. There is some uh, practice incentives, and this is a collaboration between state conservationists and our partners. Uh, practices may receive increased payments up to 90% of the cost. Uh, here in the state of Arkansas, we have not done that at this point, but we may consider that. Uh, practices should be available on uh, your payment schedules. Higher payments rates are only applicable within the local priorities delineated. So that's why we needed to delineate some areas is because uh, that's the areas that uh, these, these uh, higher cost shares would be available. Practices would address both water quality and water quantity as appropriate. And, uh, and then additional scenarios. Also in there in our locally led conservation uh, these could be uh, questions that uh, for ranking purposes that uh, may help in, in uh, 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 farmers in ranking higher, possibly if they're within an area that's designated as a high priority area. So the practices that we're, uh, we're selecting uh, were based on the National Water Quality Initiative core practices. I'm not gonna bore you with reading through that, but that's what we were using for, uh, are gonna be, that's what's gonna be used to determine that 10%. And some of those practices include conservation cover, uh, crop rotations, uh, cover crops, uh, waste facility closures, uh, field borders, riparian and herbaceous covers, forest, uh, riparian forest buffers and filter strips. So those riparian uh, covers or, or uh, borders or buffers are, are areas that say in, in the Beaver Water District uh, area, that uh, the watershed area, that that would be probably the most applicable. And some of those other ones may be too. Some additional core practices that would count uh, are listed. Uh, these may not be uh, 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 put on the uh, as an incentive for uh, up increasing the uh, cost share, but they would be counted within the uh, the uh, uh, list of the ten percent. So other programs for source water prediction where you can actually get additional funding opportunities. Uh, NWQI, uh, Source Water Protection Component, can provide funding for specific projects. And uh, Roger Cousin has been working, and I know with the uh, uh, area there in the Beaver Lake watershed, and uh, there's a new NWQI that is gonna go through. And uh, Part of that is that those areas need to have a source water protection assessment uh, for those areas. Also, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, as, as you've seen in maps before, uh, those can uh, help promote uh, 
conservation activities uh, with partners to offer value added contributions to expand the ability to address source water protection. So we'll get to the nuts and bolts and look at uh, refinement of some areas. So the local priorities that were submitted in 19 uh, uh, were a little bit large. Uh, the national office came back to those states and said, hey, we can't be more than 20% of the total land area. We are above that. Uh, so we needed to look at areas that uh, within that and break it down to less than uh, 20%. So all of those areas needed to be within a HUC-12 watershed. And, uh, and we went through some, uh, uh, a couple of meeting or a meeting where we got some feedback from local utilities and talked to some local utilities and uh, state agencies and federal agencies to see where, um, what, what type of uh, things we needed to look at for uh, uh, breaking these down. So we developed a uh, uh, source water protection working group. Uh, again, water utilities, conservation districts, uh, NRCS state technical committee members, uh, state and federal agencies. Uh, this group helped critique the initial draft and we'll continue this group as we go forward uh, through this pro process. So the factors uh, we considered when selecting the high priority areas uh, nutrients, sediments, and pathogens uh, were part of that. Uh, reported of likelihood of algal blooms, uh, water system violations, size of population served, uh, groundwater systems, and known uh, areas of aquifer depletion, and then other risks such as karst, highly erodible soils, uh, degraded habitat, uh, livestock access to surface water and wildfire risk. So some of the, the factors we use uh, were those listed. And so what we did, uh, we took, used a, uh, uh, an RGIS model and gave each uh, Huck 12 some points based on uh, some of the risk factor points. We, um, we wanted to include those areas that we know we were going to do some good work with NWQI and MRBI. So we gave uh, points for that. Uh, erodible soils, uh, excess nutrients, excess pathogens and, past and pesticides, uh, groundwater depletion, wildfire risk, uh, what percentage of the watershed was in a uh, source water protection area designated by EPA. Uh, and then uh, we wanted to make sure that we were outside of federal lands because that's, uh, and gave uh, points, more points if it was outside of federal land. So that's how we use our point scale to give uh, Hux uh, points so that we could look at uh, where uh, we might uh, uh, look at for some of those high priority areas. So again, watersheds entirely within federal land were zeroed out. Watersheds which were partially within federal lands may receive, receive five points and those that were completely outside were given 10 points. So you can kind of see where we were going with that. Uh, if it was in an initiative project area, uh, we gave it 10 points. And uh, then we looked at source water protection practices. If they were within those, uh, we gave them uh, higher points. Uh, water quality degradation, we use our uh, state resource assessment to look at uh, these uh, these risks and uh, that pretty pretty uh, helpful again that's our water quality degradation pathogens 
and pesticides. Obviously, that would be over in Warsaw in eastern Arkansas. Then our car karst geology, obviously that swath up in northern Arkansas, the limestone area. Our groundwater decline area, and that's what an area that we used uh, as a as a factor, especially our uh, groundwater initiative area that's designated in the uh, uh, map to the right. Also within this was wildfire. So wildfire is, is, is more uh, of an issue down uh, in South Arkansas and Western. It's not, the scale is just relative and it's not a, it's necessarily a nationwide scale, but uh, just relative to areas in Arkansas. So we get down to a, our draft for our high priority areas. Those areas of watersheds that have a shading of, uh, of a yellowish to brown are those that we are considering for our high priority area. Um, and uh, that's within the hatched area, which is our original area. So um, again, that amounts to about 6.7 million acres. Uh, we were looking at being below 6.8 million acres for an area designated. Uh, the areas in red designate some MRBI and NWQI areas that are within those areas. So, uh, you know, we're looking at you know, all, you know, all parts of the state uh, have some areas within that. And uh, we're gonna to try to get some comment here pretty quickly. So uh, from, from our partners to see if that's uh, acceptable. We've already got some back uh, from some of our areas. So this is uh, uh, kind of a work in progress a little bit, but uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is where we're going. There's, uh, we're uh, working with, uh, our state technical committees, uh, our subcommittees on, on looking at that practices that uh, may need to be, have more incentive. And uh, we'll get that through and then get some comment back from our uh, local entities. So I think that's it. If there's any questions. Um, don't know if there's any questions in the chat or if there's any questions, uh, uh, it, but that's that's what I have for today. Thank you, Edgar. Um, uh, yeah, we are welcome to your questions if anybody has any. Um, I guess, so when does NRCS expect to see these finalizations to these priority areas? Yeah, it's going to be here pretty quick. We're going to send this back through. Um, and and again, this is a moving uh, a moving thing. So each fis fiscal year, we can can adjust this. So we'll send this up by the end of the month, which is fairly quick, and then um, look at uh, uh, getting the group back together as far as looking at hey, is there areas here that uh, we can um, put a more emphasis on. For the Beaver Watershed District, or that, that Beaver Watershed, watershed, there was, uh, you know, we, we included a lot of that area. And of course, a lot, there's two watersheds there that are selected for NWQI. So we wanted to make sure that those were included. We did have a question uh, about the maps. Are those available yeah. online? They are in a story map, and I can uh, we can have that available to y'all. Yes. Okay. And um, and then one more question here: uh, Have recent EPA changes to the definitions of waterways and the Clean Water Act um, changed the way the NRCS defines priority areas related to farming practices? Hmm. Not for source water protection. Now, there is some discussion, I know, for, 
for other activities, but not necessarily for source water protection. Excellent. I think that's all the questions. Um, Edgar, thank you so much for your time and, and this presentation. And um, we just look forward to continue to work with you and, um, and, and just stay aligned with, with what's going on at the state level. So. Right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can stop share. Okay, so um, so we're a little ahead of schedule, and um, which is great. And I guess uh, we could just take a moment, and um, maybe we could do a giveaway. So we've got gift cards from Bass Pro Tractor Supply and uh, Gearhead Outfitters. So let's do a little giveaway here, and um, I think Carrie Byron. Uh, we might have a moment here to do a couple of poll questions before we move on to the next um, session. So, Carrie, if you want to start those poll questions. Yeah, so where did you hear about this event? Um, and also, what stakeholder group do you represent today? Excellent. Okay. Okay. So our first three gift card winners are Alvin Peer, Joseph Dillon, and you'll have to look in the chat box. Uh, I really don't want to mess up your name here, <laughs> but these gift cards um, are announced over here in the chat area, and these will be sent to you in the email um, that you registered with. So thank you, Carrie. Um, I appreciate uh, uh, you helping with that and um, we'll enjoy your $50 gift card today. So our next uh, part of this symposium is to move more into the local level topics. And um, we basically have, have two sets of um, uh, presentations. The first one is going to be with uh, the Discovery Farm Program and the University. Um, the second second part will be with um, Dr. Haggard and um, Dr. Scott talking more about the water quality projects and the pond optimization project. Um, but we do have a couple of board members helping us for this next session. Um, Billy Ammons is uh, an Alliance board member, also works with Blue and Green um, here in Northwest Arkansas. And he's going to be introducing um, Dr. Sharpley. And James McCarty is also a Beaver Watershed Alliance board member. Um, and he's the environmental manager with Beaver Water District. And he will be introducing the speakers after that. So, um, Billy, if you're ready, um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and we can introduce Dr. Sharpley. Very good, very good. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm certainly pleased that uh, everyone could join us today. Uh, we are very privileged today to have uh, Dr. Andrew Sharpley to uh, join us and provide us with uh, input and uh, some a presentation of what he, he has been up to lately. Uh, Dr. Sharpley is a distinguished professor of soils and water quality with the Division of Agriculture in the University of Arkansas system. His research currently is investigating uh, fertilizer nutrient cycling in the soil plant water systems in relation to agricultural production, conservation, and water quality. He works very closely with producers, farmers, and action agencies 
stressing the dissemination and application of his research and leads an on-farm program to show the benefits of conservation stewardship, to increase fertilizer use efficiency, to promote sustainable farming systems, and to protect water quality. He was a 2017 president of the Soil Science Society of America, and in 2008 was inducted into the USDA ARS Hall of Fame. Everyone who's worked with Dr. Sharpley over the years, uh, I think, that I know of, has found that to be a privilege, and I think that we are, are privileged today to have uh, him on our panel. So we'll turn the time over to Dr. Andrew Sharpley. Uh, thanks very much, um, Billy. So I'll, um, I um, appreciate that and uh, the opportunity to um, talk to the Alliance today about um, some of the work we've been doing and, and more recently some of the new connections and collaborations we have with the Alliance and its members. So um, I will uh, look to share my screen here and get this working, hopefully. Um, so Here we go. Um, Discovery Farms and Discovery Watershed is in Northwest Arkansas and, and Beaver Lake Watershed um, is what we're going to talk about. Um, and probably some of you have heard of the Discovery Farm program already. It's been around now for um, quite a few years. Um, we're very fortunate to have a lot of collaborators that have worked um, with us. Um, to make this possible, um, ANRC, um, I, I don't know your new name, Ryan, but um, I know it's not that now, but they were instrumental in getting us initial funding to get some equipment up and running back around 2010, 11. And NRCS uh, Farm Bureau um, opened a lot of doors and helped get this, but you can see there's a, a, a variety of um, commodity groups that have funded um, and continue to uh, pretty diverse the program has benefited a lot from uh, th these um, funding sources um, through conservation grants and also through um, what we call soft grants so we um, we kind of work um, to try and obviously fill these coffers as, as we go along but um, we've um, We've had some success and I'd just like to talk a little bit about that and these are the, we originally had about four farms, Jeff Marley we we're going to talk a little bit about, the Marley farm um, was one of the first uh, and the Dabs farm down on the east uh, in Arkansas, uh, there were I think four farms we had at the beginning um, and Farm Bureau wanted a dozen, well um, after about six, seven years they got their wish and we now have about a dozen uh, farms to be pretty diverse up in this area in northwest Arkansas we're looking at poultry um, and beef grazing mainly um, we do have a peach orchard farm which is looking more at irrigation and um, orchard management and um, over in the delta area uh, we tend to have more of our row crop dominant agriculture and looking at uh, water quality and also um, other members have already talked about this Ed. Uh, um, which is also critically important as well as just nutrient uh, use and nutrient loss. So just wanted to briefly talk about two farms up here, give you a bit of a flavor of what's going on, what's done, what we've found um, and how the program, you know, helps um, a wide diversity of people. And also just trying to touch on one farm down in the Delta, just to give you a, um, a, an idea of what's going on there. So these are the conservation practice, um, NRCS uh, standards for most of them. There's a couple there that um, hay feed, credit and concrete paths that we're doing some work, um, contain residuals, byproducts, some of them from the Beaver Water District, um, from drinking water treatment residuals um, that are not practices, but uh, we're doing enough, hopefully, research to justify that they do have benefits um, to uh, or quality that in, in the future there may be some um, uh, cost share programs available possibly um, but as I say we work to get the science behind that to support those measures so those are the conservation practices uh, livestock and the row crop you can see with a variety 
Um, and there's a predominance of um, no-till cover crops, which obviously are the main ones I think that farmers are embracing in soil health, uh, although um, it's active here in the state is still, uh, I think, an area with soil health as to it, it is a um, very popular, but I think we're still struggling or still working to actually define and have some unified um, metrics that are consistent and probably will won't. It probably varies from state to state or region to region as to what soil health uh, actually means to a, a farmer and the benefits of it. But uh, these are the different practices. Um, irrigation management has been very, very uh, fruitful in, in um, reducing runoff um, in, and also increasing water use efficiency. So the, on the um, Marley farm, um, you can see in the backdrop there, there are uh, the poultry houses, there's 10 houses, um, about um, two, 20, 230,000 broilers at any one time, uh, has about 300 head of cattle. Um, and we started working, as I said, with, with Jeff. We, we um, Johnny Gonzalez with, uh, uh, in, in Benton County now, um, suggested he would be a good collaborator and he, he was jolly well right. Um, he's been a great collaborator and a great uh, spokesperson for this and he's actually in the Beaver watershed. Um, so when we approached him we wanted to know what type of information he wanted to know a little bit more about in terms of nutrient use, nutrient runoff. Um, he had been undergoing like a lot of other poultry farmers in this area spot inspections from EPA, looking at fans and dust and uh, spilt litter, uh, basically as a carryover from some lawsuits in the uh, Chesapeake Bay. Um, no violations, nobody's found anything that was wrong, but it certainly uh, created some attention within the, uh, the farming community, at least the, the poultry far farmers, um, to you know, see w w what they're doing, um, and if um, if they're doing a good good job, um, you know the finger was being pointed at them, and they felt that they were doing doing a pretty good job, and um, but didn't have the background or the uh, data, the information, uh, the science to support that, and that was part of the main reason for the the program is to provide the science, provide the data that supports. Um, the efficiency and the efficacy of some of these conservation practices. Um, you know, con the, the point sources uh, can measure those nutrients coming out of a pipe into a river. Uh, it's a lot harder for farmers dealing with non-point. And so this program was, was founded on those, uh, I think, goals. And so this is the layout of Jeff's farm. We have a, a farm pond that was built mainly to provide material to build up these houses off of the floodplain um, and what we have with uh, four different flumes I'm just going to talk about two of them here today but um, coming off the runoffs coming off of these houses here you can see um, we have flume two which collects runoff coming off of these bottom uh, two three houses um, it goes through a grass to waterway and we have another flume um, which is located here. This is flume two in, in the background, you can't see, but it's uh, flume three, it's about 400 feet. Um, just off screen to the right is the White River. Uh, there is an ephemeral stream where runoff will go into here and then go into the, um, to the White. So Jeff was very conscious of um, wanting to maintain his practices in, in, in the best way possible. Um, and he felt that um, having this grass waterway may be a fairly in if, uh, efficient, cost effective way of, of managing if any nutrients are coming off here. So the first premise of well, w were there a lot of nutrients coming off here or not? I mean, that, that was still a bit of an uh, unknown. Um, and also, if there were, could this grass waterway? So that's what he felt he, he would like to try. And that's how this establishment of uh, these monitoring here shows that. So, We've now had about um, from 13 to 2019, we've got seven years of data. Uh, we've gone through some wet years and some dry years. And I think that's part of this program that it's an extended program. It really gives us the flexibility to look at over a period of time rather than uh, a couple of years where you may have um, 
extremes of work in terms of annual, but um, so we've gone through the gamut of, of um, differences uh, here with, with weather. So these are the total losses in kilograms per hectare coming off of um, the house area, uh, about six kilograms, um, 12 kilograms here in 15, which was a wet year, uh, drier years, it drops off. So a lot of this is, is somewhat flow dependent. But you can see the amounts that were we were measuring in the uh, down slope uh, after the grass waterway were lower uh, than they were coming off of the houses. So there was nutrients being trapped, phosphorus, and also nitrogen being trapped um, in nitrogen. Probably some of that was nitrate that was being uh, infiltrating into the ground um, as, they, as the water moves slowly over that grass waterway. Uh, reducing that, in, you know, the nutrients that might get into the white. So clearly there was some uh, a benefit of having this grass waterway in, in trapping um, the um, nutrients. So um, the initiation of this study was uh, Jeff agreed to fence cattle out of this area, uh, not apply fertilizer uh, or litter to it so that we could look at um, comparing the in and the out without having confounding variables that might have affected what was going on in that area between uh, the up, up house one and the end of the grass waterway uh, flu measurements. Um, but what was happening was, um, like a lot of things, um, the litter was, was uh, providing a good source uh, for forage and for um, pasture growth. And around 2017, when uh, after about four years of not adding any um, nutrients to that area, they started to see a decline in pasture uh, density and uh, vigor. And so he applied litter to that area and, and you can see that the, the, the benefit of the grass waterway was, was reduced, which, is, which, which makes sense, especially for, for phosphorus luminescy with nitrogen. But um, the point is here that these practices do work but there is always a trade-off that um, you need to manage that area to continue the efficiency of that um, practice and to make sure it continues to work. Um, you know, and so last year we'll have some data this year too, but it, it is starting, it is just benefit still. It, it, the patch is coming back and the um, grass waterway is, is becoming effective again. So this is the average, uh, just the over that period of time, you can see that the dissolved total phosphorus reductions here, about 20, 30 percent, um, 25 to 30 uh, for phosphorus averaged over that year, over different you know, weather years, compared to um, um, reduction, the nitrogen reduction was, 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 uh, was greater. Um, but you know, part of that was due to a reduction in flow. So there was a benefit. It was uh, easy. Uh, just basically, uh, Jeff using his tractor to create uh, an area that would uh, spillway that would go into the grass waterway. So it was an effective, uh, cost-effective way of uh, retaining nutrients on on the on the farm. The, the next farm was the, I'm going to just briefly mention is the uh, Moore farm. Um, we had um, started working with Alan and um, uh, Curtis Moore um, to um, monitor the farm. Um, and Ralph Moore, who was the, uh, uh, the father, was looking at um, building some new poultry barns. Um, these are the new poultry barns, the, uh, the, what we look at with the south part of here. Um, there, there were some hen uh, barns here that were damaged, uh, actually collapsed during a snowstorm, ice storm, and so they were able to just tear that down and um, replace, and Curtis came back to the farm, young farmer, um, and it was operating these four barns. You can actually see some concrete pads here, which I'll touch on um in, in a minute but the idea was that we were working with um the moors prior to building these new uh houses so we could create a what we felt might be a um, reduced nutrient footprint 
um, by looking at you know the design beforehand rather than to try and fix some problem after the uh, after the houses were built. So these are the original houses, um, uh, the traditional uh, gravel entryway. You can see some spillage. Um, it's part of operating. You, you can't really uh, avoid doing that when you have bird uh, harvesting or clean out. Uh, you can see here some, you know, the clean out does cause some spillage. Some of that obviously is going to be moved. That litter will be either hauled off or put back into the, uh, into the house, but you can't get it all. Um, and um, so we're working with the Walton family uh, to provide some funds for this farm um, and looked at uh, putting in a concrete pad um, outside the entranceway to the new houses. Um, and this was um, um, cost about three, four thousand dollars. It's probably you know fairly expensive, but we'll be able to, to, to look at getting some cost reduction of amount of nutrients reduced per cost investment in this type of pad. There were some um, you know benefits um, in terms of actually the, the idea was that if you get some spillage on here, you can scrape that back into the house and you can clean it off much easier than the gravel. Um, the farmers would be very reluctant to push that litter back into the house with gravel because that's just going to create um, a hazard for the birds uh, walking on it so that's just not feasible and so that was the, the main idea here um, one of the additional benefits was that actually the, uh, the feed trucks and the other uh, maintenance equipment that was going in and out of these uh, this area could use this as a turnaround without uh, creating divots or tracks that would accentuate nutrient runoff or, or, or runoff losses. So there were some multiple benefits, some, some direct, some indirect. We built a berm, a berm, well, a berm was created, uh, the Moors did it, um, so that water would flow um, to the north or south here and not go through the houses. We we're trying to avoid water coming from upslope through here to wash nutrients down, down slope. Um, and we were able to collect water coming off of uh, the, um, this area, the backside of the houses where the fans are, where the, um, some of the dust is emitted and some of the hot spots that uh, EPA were concerned about. And also from this area where there was some row crop agriculture. So uh, Larry Berry, who, who uh, couldn't uh, be here, but um, set up the sampling equipment so that we could collect samples from both of these sites and same uh, creating a uh, berm in this area here between these two where we could isolate runoff coming off of the fronts of these houses, uh, the new and the old, and collect the water and, and analyze it. So here you can see um, the work that Larry um, helped do to create, initially create this um, berm down the track with the new houses and the original houses. This has now grown up, uh, these, these um, kind of uh, uh, gullies or um, ditches, temporary uh, ditches that are now got grassed over. But this initial idea gives you a, um, an indication of the water that was running down here, which we collect here uh, with our ISCO samplers. Um, same at all of the sites, triggered by flow, collect samples, sends us a message, the samplers here, you need to come and collect them. Uh, we get one sample per storm. Um, it's a flow weighted sample and um, analyze that within 24, um, well, we initiate this analysis within eight hours um, and Brian Haggard's lab uh, do those analyses for us. So this is what we found over that uh, period of time, a little bit shorter time, uh, five years um, and counting um, the original houses in green and the red is the um, new houses. So you can see a dramatic reduction. Now, there was some time to bed in. The efficiency has improved with time. Obviously, as the grass is established on those uh, ditchways in front of the houses so we're to collecting the water after the excavation work that was done to initiate these house, uh, new houses and build them. But you can see here we've got a, uh, a pretty impressive nutrient reduction um, uh, by, by installation of these pads. 
just briefly, the Stevens farm, um, Steve, Steve Stevens was um, probably in the middle of our um, enrollment of the program down in the Delta um, at Dumas. And he was a good example of a farmer that we talked to that uh, said, no way, I don't want to get involved in this program. It's not for me. And we realized it's not for everybody. Um, the, the, the conversation continued between him and extension agents, county agents, and also some other farmers. And eventually he came, um, he decided to get involved. Uh, he was concerned that uh, doing this type of work would open him up to APA and to uh, um, inspectors and to all sorts of uh, issues that he um, he would never have envisaged if, if he wasn't part of that program. And that, that's, that's, he, he had a, a valid uh, point that um, we had to respect. Um, however, um, that actually hasn't happened. And uh, actually, Steve Stevens is one of our most um, avid um, proponents and spokespeople, especially for the row crop uh, conservation on the program. So um, it shows part of the benefits of the program, which I'll just touch on in, the, um, in, a, in a few minutes. So just an example here, um, this is two fields just after a, a three and a half inch rain, the top here is, has been tilled um, with no cover crop. We have comparison and Mike Daniels, who's a co-leader co with this program was overseeing this um, and a, a field that was um, in no-till with cover crops. Um, and you can see that um, there's a um, obvious difference in surface water, surface water potential for runoff uh, between these two. So um, I think this is a real striking point image um, of the program in showing this experiential learning um, that um, it uh, displays firsthand some of the benefits of these conservation practices. Uh, we can have fact sheets, we can have uh, conservation standards, but actually a farmer seeing it or his neighbor seeing it in, in action certainly helps, uh, I think, their willingness to embrace all these practices. This is what we've been finding. Um, you can see that the decline has increased from 13 to 2018 um, as the practices have, have reduced or no-till and cover crops get established. And so there, you know, I think a point is that there is a video variation in the efficiency of these practices with rainfall. Um, sometimes with the heavy rains, heavy floods, large, large uh, rainfall events, which we had a couple of years ago, they just overweigh the system. And the efficiency is, is, is not as great. We can't expect it to be, but um, it does show that sometimes these practices or these conservation measures uh, do take time to become fully effective. We can't assume that they're gonna work the first year uh, that they put in some of them. So it's more than just uh, collecting data. Um, the camera lady there is uh, Jeff's daughter. This is a, a more, uh, more farm, but she works with agriculturalists and um, that uh, to get a, a degree. She's now in um, in Fort Collins getting a master's. Um, but we did these virtual tours of each uh, of all the discovery farms. She helped with that. But this is um, um, Curtis Moore. Um, so it engages the farmers. It's facilitating them. The program is facilitating them, not just about collecting data, but it's it, it's more than that. Facilitating to be proactive, be part of the solutions. Um, this is your some reporters that came over from the Chesapeake Bay to see what was happening here. Why were we getting uh, so many farmers interested and willing to uh, do on-farm monitoring, whereas um, the Chesapeake Bay um, were having issues and uh, weren't able to do that. Uh, this was probably around February. You see, it's a little bit cooler than what it was, what it is at the moment. Um, I think part of the Part of the difference probably is that uh, TMDL is enforced in, in the Chesapeake. So it, it just changes that dynamic a little bit. But we do have lawsuits here between Oklahoma uh, and Arkansas, which puts these um, farmers at risk in opening their um, operations to, um, you know, edgy field monitoring of water quality. But it involves them in the process.
and involve us in being part of the solution uh, rather than being the end product of you need to do this and you need to do that when, when decisions are made. Um, we've seen firsthand this farmer to farmer education. Uh, we saw it in Wisconsin, we went to visit their program. Farmers listen to other farmers, believe it or not. Um, they certainly don't, you know, um, are less likely to listen to myself, more likely maybe to listen to Mike when he, he talks, but definitely the, there is this uh, trust among farmers that um, I think is an important point of um, the benefits that we are seeing from this type of a program. As educating policymakers, here we have um, Mike talking to um, Senator Bozeman and his uh, some of his staff people. Uh, this is at our um, Atkins site. Um, Mark Cochran and uh, Randy Young in the background. So it's a, it, it's a couple of years old, this photograph, but it does show the um, interest in some of our um, policymakers to um, get away from Washington and get out in the field, get into their constituency and to uh, talk to the farmers and see what's working. So, um, you know, we've benefited, I think, quite a lot from, from that by the farmers wanting to um, uh, promote this type of work to, uh, to policymakers. Um, some of those you know, aides and others, um, you know, experience from uh, when I was working in Arkansas, uh, probably not here, but I know in, in sorry, in, in Pennsylvania, um, some of those aides hadn't, uh, ag aides had actually not been on a farm and were kind of surprised as to what went on. And I think we still find that, that um, especially with poultry production, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. A lot of people that are not involved with farming um, come to look at some of these farms and realize, oh, this is how it really operates. Um, and so I think that, you know, enhances this broader adoption. Um, what we found, especially from, you know, Steve Stevens, that uh, you give them a bit of data, they want more data. Uh, you tell them that their water use efficiency has increased from 75 to 95%. Well, how can I get it to 99%? And so, you know, I think that's another big point of this program is that data begets more data. And as I mentioned, we're engaging the non-farming sector. We've had the Chamber of Commerce at Fayetteville and other areas come out to some of these farms to um, you know, see what's going on firsthand rather than reading in, in, the, in the press. So where are we now? Um, the, 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 the program is still going on. Obviously it will continue. Um, and expand or change or the practices will change um, but we're shifting with the support of the Beaver Watershed Alliance and, um, and ANRC and others to try and look at um, source water protection or discovery watersheds um, as Ed had mentioned showed these maps so I won't linger on them too much but uh, looking at uh, protecting Beaver Lake um, by looking at the source water and treating that area um, rather than trying to treat the water. Um, and I think this is probably a great opportunity for the discovery program to, to uh, morph into what we would call a discovery watershed uh, program. So where we'd be scaling up from the edge of field measurements to, to the watershed. And, and Brian Haggard is going to be you know, helping, working with us. His expertise is more in a watershed um, uh, measurement and, and ours is more edgy field so I think we have a great relationship that we can that we can benefit from here but I think it's just a, a critical way we've all, all um, Randy Young always challenged us when we gave annual updates on the discovery farm program well that's good um, looking at edgy field but what's happening at a watershed you need to show me you know the benefits at a watershed level um, because that's oftentimes where um, management strategies and um, uh, other decisions are being made. Um, and so it, it's trying to scale that up. Um, it would require land user buy-in. So I think we're looking at a smaller area initially, likely 12 or 14 digit hut level. Um, it's a smaller land area that would have uh, fewer landowners uh, in it, 
we need to minimize the complexity to, to a large extent, um, not have a huge mix of rural, urban, and other uh, operations going on so that we can um, work with the majority of the landowners to implement conservation measures and then continue to monitor to look at the um, eff efficacy in terms of how that comes um, to reduce losses at a watershed scale. Um, again, I think it's critical um, that you know the selection of the watersheds is such that it reflects the um, local uh, landscape, but um, it also um, has to be feasible that we can work with those landowners and those landowners that would be willing to, to work with us to implement conservation practices. Um, and so, you know, the end product is looking at, you know, that nutrient discharge. Um, we would hope that uh, the, um, this type of program would have some ongoing um, support because in the edgy field, probably, like we say, with three to five years, but I think as we go to a larger scale, the uh, time of change or the timelines that affect that change are going to probably increase a little bit. So we probably um, are looking at a minimum of five years, probably to be able to see some of uh, what we would think of as reliable, um, realistic, um conclusions interpretations from from adoption of conservation so it's not a, a again it, it's a long-term investment and, and it's a investment i think that is uh critical um because we know that it's a heck of a lot easier and cheaper to um, manage nutrient sources than it is to manage the impact of those sources once it gets into for example be the lake. And so resting on that um, idea, that thought, um, this is New York. I was involved when it first went to uh, Pennsylvania with ARS, um, with the Catskills program up there, um, ongoing, but then they started to look at some conservation and uh, watershed programs there. And Cannesville Reservoir was constructed um, the reservoir itself was constructed back in the 50s, much like the Beaver watershed, as a drinking water source supply um, to um, New York City. Um, it's about 150 miles as a crow flies. They pipe that water to the city. Um, and so it has become you know, one of the main sources of water to the city now that um, they're obviously dependent on. And so they established, as I mentioned, in the uh, probably mid 90s, this water protection program. Um, they realized, as I mentioned earlier, it was cheaper to treat the source of the nutrients in the watershed than, than to upgrade their water treatment uh, facilities. Um, estimates, um, which probably changed, this was you know, at the time that they, they justified doing this. Um, the cost of of the watershed program um, was about 50 million compared to eight billion dollars at that time to upgrade the, the, the treatment facilities. So it was uh, obviously cost effective, and a uh, you know not just an an economic way, but a common sense way to approach in, uh, you know source water protection. So um, and so it, it became one of the the first programs that targeted. Uh, the sources rather than treating the symptoms. And I think this is where it's important that we, we look at Beaver Watershed um, and to implement those, those same practices. And I know that work is ongoing through the um, district and you know, through the Alliance. So just to briefly, you know, the New York City Watershed Program, um, I think these are critical parts, and this is why we're looking at you know a smaller watershed to be um, a, at least an initial investment here. Um, there's about 190 farms in Cannesville watershed. Um, they got 93 over 93 percent uh, um, participation, voluntary participation in the program, which was critical to get that higher number uh, for it to be effective. Um, one of the uh, carrots 
was 100% kosher. Um, I think that was the investment that New York City realized that they had to make. Um, that I don't think we're going to see here, but um, that was certainly part of the success. You can't really ignore the fact that um, uh, these conservation measures, whether it was a barnyard um, improvement from a dairy to avoid runoff of filter fields, whatever it was, um, holding areas for um, cattle feeding, um, it was implemented at 100% rather than um, 50, 70%. However, it did um, allow the collaboration and commitment and investment in this type of a program um, resulted in success. Um, uh, here we see um, the recent um, EPA 319 uh, conclusions that, um, you know, th that the restoration activities in the upper branch of the Delaware, which was the um, Cannonsville um, did, did decrease nutrient loads, um, dissolved and uh, particular phosphorus. So just really relating here with phosphorus because those are probably the main two uh, parameters, uh, dissolved in particular, which were affecting the water quality of the um, other counties for water that was being piped down to, uh, to New York. Um, you know, fresh water, therefore, it was probably um, dominated by phosphorus inputs rather than nitrogen. So it, we're getting a, a great reduction in dissolved which would be the immediate uh, bioavailable form and particular loads were also decreasing. So um, a win-win in that case. And I think that is a good example that we can use hopefully to uh, garner support for this type of a program within the Beaver uh, Lake Watershed. So with that, um, thank you. All right, very good, Dr. Sharpley. We appreciate that. There, there is a question uh, that's come through, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Is the total phosphorus reduction from concrete pads comparable to a grassed waterway? Um, it, probably, it probably is uh, very similar. Um, I think the... Um, Part of the grass, but the concrete pad would be some of the cleanup and removal of the source of nutrients. Um, otherwise, it is it is going to um, to move off. But um, uh, different processes, I think, but they they would be comparable. Um, I think um, obviously the grass waterway would be um, more cost effective. Um, so similar, but I think you know the the, the caveat would be that um, one is designed for in front of the houses, and the other would be designed for more um, of a non-point movement away from a, an area. I hope that helps. Sure. So to go on with that, just a uh, how much area per house would be required for the grass waterway to be success successful? Um, I think in this case it was a couple of acres that field um, but I think the distance probably four or five hundred is probably more critical the distance that you would um, have for that grass waterway um, as opposed to the area um, and I think NRCS engineers uh, Tom Dodds I think who's on the meeting for example uh, could estimate probably the length of uh, grass water that way that might be needed, similar to, to creating or measuring a, um, a buffer based on slope, based on, you know, upslope conditions. So I think um, it's flexible, but I think NRCS had the tools and the expertise probably to, um, to give a farmer a good idea of an appropriate length of that um, of that uh, grass waterway. One thing we did do with with Jeff, Jeff was uh, he aerated the uh, with the help of the alliance um, the pasture to improve infiltration uh, two or three years into the program. So there are some benefits. There are some other things that could enhance or maybe reduce that uh, grass waterway length or at least increase its efficacy. 
Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. It's terribly interesting and uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts and uh, for on the behalf of the Alliance, we're thankful for all the people who participate from the farmer's perspective, the making this go forward. Very good. So we are uh, we're pretty much right on time. We're getting ready to have a discussion on one of my favorite projects. And for that introduction and work with that, we'll turn time over to Mr. James McCarty of the Beaver Water District. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm James McCarty. I'm the Environmental Quality Manager with the Beaver Water District, uh, but also a board member with the Watershed Alliance. And uh, I have the privilege this morning of introducing um, Dr. Brian Haggard and Dr. Thad Scott. Dr. Haggard is the director of the Arkansas Water Resource Center. He's also a professor in the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Program at the University of Arkansas. And uh, he's done a ton of research on Beaver Lake and its watershed along with Thad Scott. And so we're, we're lucky to have him here this morning along with Thad. Um, Dr. Haggard is going to be talking to us about some water quality in the West Fork. Um, Dr. Scott is a uh, professor of biology at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, formerly a Razorback, um, but um, we won't hold that against him that he went to Baylor. Uh, Thad is also an excellent limnologist and uh, has also done a ton of research on uh, Beaver Lake and its watershed. And so we're, we're lucky to have him here this morning as well. He's going to be uh, giving us an update on a project that was done by the Alliance um, to investigate um, the use of ponds in reducing nutrients and sediment uh, runoff to the watershed. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to their presentations. James, thanks. Let me get my shares, my screen shared and everything. I assume we're good to go. We are good to go. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, a talk today about water quality in the West Fork of the White River. Um, you know, our objectives with this study were, you know, the, the river was uh, in the past violating some of the water quality standards applicable to this stream in the Ozark Highlands and Boston Mountains. And uh, we were trying to figure out like, what are, what are some of the sources? Is it humans? Is it natural? And, you know, to help by collecting this data plan for watershed improvements and maybe even change how the stream is listed for impairment. And because we're dealing with a river reach that's 54 uh, kilometers in length from the headwaters down to the White River. Um, the area of the watershed is about 322 square kilometers. It flows through two eco regions, the Ozark Highlands, which is you see here in the upper portion and the Boston Mountains, which is this area here. Um, <clears throat> Soil types change from upstream to downstream. You know, there's karst topography under, within this watershed. And uh, the land use of this watershed as a whole, it's 66% forest, 20% pasture, and about 14% urban. But as you can see, you know, the urban area is, is primarily located in the upper or downstream end of the watershed, you know, with the cities of uh, West Fork, Greenland, and Fayetteville. <clears throat> we monitored nine sites. You can see those nine sites here. We started this project a long time ago in June 2014, and we've been sampling one to two times per month, and it's about 18 times per year. Uh, this study of all of these sites initially focused on turbidity, TDS, chloride, and sulfate, <clears throat> and we were going to compare results to the applicable water quality standards. So <clears throat> I'm just going to jump right into uh, the data. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see a series of graphs like this where you have the water quality parameter on the x-axis. Um, any applicable standards is going to show up as this line right here. And then you're going to have distance downstream. And so this would be the most upstream site. And this would be the West Fork right before it's flowing into the main stem of the White River. And with turbidity, as you can see, turbidity is relatively low <clears throat> up in the headwaters. 
And then as you move downstream, particularly when you shift from one ecoregion to the next, you can see turbidity increasing and the, the two most downstream sites violated the water quality standard where, which is 10 NTU and uh, 59 and 47% of the samples collected over the time frame evaluated here exceeded that 10 NTU. <clears throat> if we look at total dissolved solids, the <clears throat> water quality standard applicable to the West Fork is 150 milligrams per liter. And <clears throat> you can see TDS starts out really low in the headwaters and as you start moving downstream, TDS increases. And again, just like turbidity, it was those most downstream two sites that violated the water quality standard for TDS. And we had, you know, 50 to 44% of the samples at those sites exceeding the standard. And the standard is, uh, you know, 150 milligrams per liter, which must not be exceeded in more than 25% of the samples collected. <clears throat> and so you can see here, based on these box plots, box plots, more than half of the samples collected were exceeding that standard. If we look specifically at chloride, I've got some good news here. We did not violate any water quality uh, standards for chloride. You can see the chloride standard for this, the eco regions up here is around 20 milligrams per liter. And, you know, pretty much all of the data we collected um, was less than this. But you can still see there's definitely a shift as chloride, as you move downstream, chloride concentrations are increasing. And, you know, we, we think a lot of that may have to do with how, you know, the watershed changes from upstream to downstream. When you look at sulfate, we see something a little bit different than chloride is, you know, up in the headwaters, we see very little sulfate in the water. But as you start moving downstream, we start seeing significant increases in, sul in sulfate concentrations. And the last five sites all had sulfate concentrations that would exceed the water quality standard of 20 milligrams per liter for sulfate. And uh, again, that, that would be in 20 milligrams per liter must not be exceeded in more than 25% of the samples. And uh, you can see here, you know, really about two thirds of the water quality data collected at these sites exceeded that water quality uh, standard. And so, you know, one of the things we really were interested in is, is geology an important source of these dissolved ions? And we actually were lucky that almost 20 years ago, Steve Boss <clears throat> and some collaborators looked at the bedrock geology of the West Fork Quadrangle in Washington County, and, and they published this. And, uh, and so we got a copy of this from Steve Boss, and you can see here, you know, our different sites, site six, site five, which this is a site in West Fork, site four, which is Baptist Ford, and then three point, site 3.5 is the one near the uh, airport, uh, Drake's Field. And the biggest thing that you want to look at here is, oops, is, you know, up in the headwaters, we see siltstones, limestones, sandstones, and, and there are some shales there listed, but uh, this is where we're seeing the lower sulfate concentrations. As, as, and as we start moving downstream, we start seeing an increased sulfate, you know, likely in the groundwater that's coming up in, in the base flow of the streams. And we start seeing increased uh, sulfate concentrations as we move downstream. And you can really see it's downstream of site five moving into site four where we start seeing shell pop out and the shell is actually at a level where it's interacting with the surface waters. And, uh, and, and so, you know, what we think is, is we think we are seeing a, <clears throat> a water quality change, you know, in terms of sulfate concentrations just due to uh, the geology in the area. And so we're also going to take a, a, a closer look at water quality land use in the eco regions. And so what we did here, as you can see, we have chloride concentration, sulfate, TDS, and turbidity at the very top. We're looking at how concentrations change as a function of pasture plus urban land use. And you can see as we move from the headwaters downstream, we end up with, you know, 
an increase in the amount of pasture per plus urban land use. You know, it goes from 28 to almost near 40 at the most downstream spot. Um, and we downloaded data from ADEQ's da database in you know, a variety of sites across Northwest Arkansas and the Ozarks and the Boston Mountains. And, and, uh, and you can see here, the black dots represent the Boston Mountains, the open symbols represent the Ozarks. You know, this smaller data, this is specific data from the West Fork to give you an idea how those concentrations are changing upstream to downstream there. And uh, you can see at the different relationships. And so if we start at the top, you know, we really don't see that land use is a predominant influence of turbidity across these streams in the, in the Boston's and the Ozarks, which that was actually kind of surprising to us because if you look at what's going on in the West Fork, you see a strong increase. So this suggests to us that if there's really something different going on in terms of, you know, how, why turbidity changes in the West Fork of the White River. And then the next three graphs, this is, you know, total dissolved solids, sulfate, and, and chloride. These tell a little bit different story where you definitely see a difference between ecoregions and you also see the influence of land use. And, and so as you have more pasture and urban area in the watershed, you're going to have higher TDS concentrations. You're going to have, you're going to have more sulfate and you're going to have, uh, uh, you know, higher chloride concentrations. But, you know, keep in mind, here's the 20 milligrams per liter. You know, even though we're seeing an increase in sulfate with land use, uh, you know, to exceed the 20 milligrams per liter, there's few, you know, there's not as many sites up here above 20 milligrams per liter as there are below as you increase that land use. And so it's, you know, it, it's definitely clear that land use has an impact on the water quality, e ecoregion changes, the regions these ecoregions are defined, uh, shows that there's a change in water quality. And, uh, and so we have to, you know, better understand that. And so one of the things we think that's happening with turbidity is, gosh, you know, it's crazy that this is 10 years ago when Chris Cotton, one of my honor students, <clears throat> you know, looked at turbidity from upstream to downstream and we, you know, uh, delineated the different types of soils and riparian soils really change. And there's a couple of soils that you can see here that really increase as we go downstream, you know, compared to upstream. And these soils are in close proximity with those riparian zones. And so we think that maybe, you know, the types of soils and how those soils, you know, naturally would increase turbidity in waters is one of the reasons that we see, you know, elevated turbidity as we move downstream in the West Fork. Um, we did have some success from the monitoring data that we collected. Uh, you know, ADEQ ended up separating the West Fork of the White River into two reaches. Um, and so that meant the upstream reach was no longer listed for violating turbidity or or total dissolved solids, uh, but the downstream reach was still listed. And they basically, you know, separated the reaches at the eco region divide. Um, the entire upstream portion is still listed for sulfate, even though we know, you know, from the headwaters downstream, there's this gradient in sulfate concentration. And there's that change that I showed you earlier in geology. And uh, so, you know, one of the questions that we have is kind of going forward is, is the sulfate natural? And if so, how do we account for that? And does that mean that the West Fork of the White River is really impaired? And another question that's kind of out there that's broader is, is the limit of 20 milligrams per liter in the, you know, in these ecoregions ne really necessary to protect the designated uses? You know, does the change in sulfate concentrations influence the biology and, and the water quality in a way that these these sites should be listed as impaired. And so that's kind of a bigger and broader question. And I'm, I'm, I know a lot of you, there's been a lot of talk with, you know, Discovery Farms and, and about nutrients. And one of the things that we did within the Discovery Farm uh, <coughs> kind of thoughts in is, you know, as we, we looked at how does water quality change across various reservoirs from the Beaver watershed to the Buffalo to the Illinois. 
And, uh, you know, we know that as you increase the percent of land pasture and urban land use in watersheds, you see an increase in nutrient concentrations. And so I wanted to give you an idea uh, across this gradient, where does the West Fork fall? Because, you know, the West Fork actually has really good nutrient chemistry, you know, in terms of water quality. And so we see SRP concentrations, and this is, this is be at the most downstream portion of the West Fork. This is the West Fork at Molly Wagman Bridge. You know, we see 2020 are, you know, in the data we've collected so far, the mean concentrations for SRP are 0.004 milligrams per liter. And you can see here, that's much less than what we would see on average for a basin that has, you know, roughly 35, you know, roughly almost 40% of the watershed in, you know, what, what I would say is influenced by human activity that is in pasture or urban land use. When we move down to total phosphorus concentrations, the total phosphorus concentrations are at 0.022 milligrams per liter. And this is right on that threshold of what the kind of is, you know, you would see on average for a watershed that has this land use in this area. And then when we move over to dissolve uh, to nitrate concentrations in this quadrant in the upper right, you know, this, the, you know, the concentrations that we measure across the different basins are a, a lot different, but you can see here the nitrate concentrations on average were 0.33 milligrams per liter which puts us right at or right below what you would see on average, typically with a watershed that has this land use. And when we looked at how the data has changed all the way through 2019, uh, you know, we were, we've been seeing a, a decrease in nitrate concentrations occurring in this stream at, at about 7% about per year. So we've been seeing a reduction in nitrogen occurring in this stream. And that reduction carried over to the total nitrogen concentrations, although the magnitude of decrease was quite a bit less at 1.5% uh, decrease per year. But you can see here for total nitrogen concentrations, again, the West Fork has an average concentration of about 0.5 milligrams per liter. And so, you know, in terms of nutrient chemistry, really good water quality sitting at this site. And, uh, you know, we've been monitoring these sites on the West Fork for a while. Uh, because of the data that we have, the monitoring strategy might shift a little bit to focus more on the downstream sites. And that would be the main sites, sites five, four, three, two, and one. And, uh, you know, and I would just say, if we keep building this database, eventually, you know, we, we have data starting back in the 2014 timeframe, you know, we can start looking at site specific trends and uh, kind of get an idea of what's going on, at, you know, how things are changing over time, not just at the most downstream site, but at other sites. Um, you know, funding was provided by a, a, a bunch of different sources to do this, and uh, the majority of the resources came from the Alliance. And uh, with that, I'll be glad to take any questions or we can shift right over to Thad Scott. Uh, Dr. Haggard, we got um, one question uh, from the chat. Uh, it says your data show that as a percent of land in pasture increase, so did the amount of nutrients. So you have any data on the plant composition of those pastures and how that affected nutrient loads? We don't have any specific data on the, you know, what's going on in the pastures. And, uh, but yes, as you move from upstream to downstream, we are, you know, as you move across that gradient, we know that, you know, pat, the amount of pasture in the watershed influences both nitrogen and phosphorus concentration, but we can't attribute that to any specific practices or anything like that at this time. I've got a quick question for you. Um, most of you know that uh, City of West Fork is uh, about to shut down their wastewater treatment plant and they're going to be transferring um, most of their wastewater load over to uh, the city of Fayetteville and the, uh, the east side uh, treatment plant there. How do you think that's going to affect water chemistry and the overall water quality of the West Fork? Well, I mean, I mean, removing that nutrient source is obviously going to be a positive impact 
on the West Fork of the White River. But, you know, some of the research that we've done looking specifically kind of upstream and downstream, and this was a while back, we really didn't see that much change in nutrient chemistry uh, due to the affluent discharge coming into the West Fork. And that was mainly due to it made, made up such a small proportion of the flow that we weren't able to see that. And so we might not pick up those changes in the sites that we're monitoring but still, you know, whenever you're, you're taking a source out that, you know, at a wastewater treatment plant that's operated at one level and moving it to, you know, the city of Fayetteville has really, you know, really low nutrient uh, affluent concentrations, that's going to be a positive thing for the watershed. Yeah, thanks for answering that. Um, I've got one other question um, from some of the attendees. This is coming from your former employee, Aaron Scott. Uh, do the data show any impact or improvement from the stream bank restoration done at the airport site by uh, WCRC? No, not, not really, I would say. You know, I think, and I had a long conversation with a colleague at Clemson yesterday who works on stream restoration projects. And, and really what you see with those types of projects is bank stabilization and the reduction of nutrients flowing in from the bank you typically don't see a change in, you know, nutrient chemistry, as I would say it in the stream. You know, the positive things from restoration are both in, you know, better habitat in stream and reduction in, you know, sediment inputs from bank erosion and nutrient inputs from bank erosion. But picking that up with grab sample monitoring, I, I you know, I don't, I'm not aware of a study that's, that's been able to do that yet. I've got uh, one last question for you. Um, just based on your presentation, it, it looks like, um, you know, we're real close to calling the West Fork a success, success story. Uh, you know, between the WCRC repairing uh, or restoring, you know, some of the, the largest sediment um, load reaches um, in the stream and, you know, with delisting the lower portions and, um, and, and just seeing kind of where the, the stream sits, you know, within the rest of the watershed, comparing that to Illinois as well, it really looks like the West Fork is in a, a great position. And so I'm wondering, you know, as, as somebody who funds these projects and um, is always looking for the next thing, you know, is it time to, to turn our attention, you know, somewhere else? You know, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, looking at it from my perspective, you know, I would say that if what we're interested in is, you know, nutrient reductions, there's probably some other areas within the Beaver Lake watershed where we need to shift our focus for sure. Um, with that, I would say, you know, there's still sites that stream banks that are eroding, you know, uh, within the West Fork watershed that I think should still be a priority for some stream bank restoration. I mean, one of the main areas is the area downstream of the Dead Horse Mountain Road Bridge. You know, the, the upstream area there was, re <coughs> was restored not too long ago or improved. And I'd love to see that downstream area focused on too. But in regards to nutrients, there's, there's definitely some other focuses uh, across the watershed. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Haggard, for your uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Thad Scott uh, for a, a talk on um, ponds and how they are helpful in reducing uh, sediment nutrient transport. And it looks like he is starting up his uh, presentation now, so I'll turn it over to you, Thad. Okay, thanks, James. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, so it was nice to have Brian end with that discussion about um, uh, stream bank erosion specifically in the West Fork because really that's what stimulated the beginning of this project um, eight or eight or six or eight years ago now. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a project we've been working on for the last couple of years but I wanted to give some background on where uh, that project came from. In uh, 2000, oh, let's see, my slides aren't going forward. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, so the question we were interested in asking here, um, the overarching question for the entire project is, how effectively can ponds reduce peak flow 
during storms and thereby reduce erosion and ultimately sediment and nutrient transport to rivers. Uh, so the stream bank erosion question for the West Fork in particular back in 2010, 2012, 2014 was really unknown. And so we, with support um, from the uh, Beaver Watershed Alliance back in that time, brought, I say we, Brian Haggard and I, uh, developed a really simple mathematical model for simulating how we might utilize ponds as a best management practice in the watershed for slowing down water and reducing stream bank erosion. And this is just a little, this is published um, 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 in the Arkansas Water Resources Center uh, publication group, technical bulletins, and so you can go look it up there. Um, but basically what we did was we took the West Fork watershed, we divided it up into I forget how many exactly, 200 some odd sub basins. And then we modeled what it would mean for the hydrology if we, if we added a flood control pond at the outlet of each of these sub basins. And this table gives you um, a sense of what we found. Um, we basically came up with four different scenarios with uh, decreasing numbers of ponds and pond flood storage that gave us differing results on reducing peak flow. So the four scenarios kind of uh, shook out this way. Um, in scenario one, we only had 143 of the sub basins where we had would, would model a pond placement. Scenario two, um, 70 ponds, uh, I'm sorry, 115 ponds. Scenario three, 41 ponds. And scenario four, only 22 ponds. And what this represents going from scenario one to scenario four is basically an increase in risk right, and the amount of peak flow leaving these sub watersheds. So when peak flow is really high, these ponds can be really effective tools for storing the peak flow, storing flow temporarily and reducing the peak flow of an individual storm event. And that's the goal we were uh, sort of shooting for. So here's that same thing seen graphically here. So each of the four scenarios, the black um, circles, indicate a typical uh, storm event for the watershed and they're the same in all four scenarios but the white circles show you within that management scenario what we were able to change peak flow to and this is equivalent if you think about it to flattening the curve like we've been talking about so much in the last several months with coronavirus um, so we get a, a a shorter peak but a, a, a wider tell. And so what generally happens is the amount of water leaving the watershed is equal if you go out far enough in time. It's just we're slowing down how fast that water is actually leaving the watershed. And the ponds look like pretty effective management tools for doing that. So if you just take the plot, the number of ponds against the reduction, the percent reduction in peak flow, what we found from this modeling scenario is we could maybe get as much as a 60% uh, reduction in peak flow by adding a lot of ponds to these sub watersheds throughout the throughout the West Fork uh, uh, watershed. But even if we only added as few as 20 ponds, we still get a uh, 15 20 percent reduction uh, in peak flow, and that's because we would be str strategically placing these ponds in very high risk sub watersheds that have uh, a high high that contribute lar a large amount of the peak flow in any given event. So the problem with this modeling study is in order to do it, we had to make a lot of assumptions. Um, and four of probably the biggest assumptions that we made was one, that it would, there would be a single pond at the outlet of every sub watershed, which is hard to do when you have 200 some odd sub watersheds at that size. It's hard to imagine building that many ponds in, in, the, in, a, in the West Fork. Um, also that these ponds would be pretty large, anywhere from one to five acres in size, and they would be proportional, their size would be proportional to the sub watershed size. And then the last two are the two assumptions that I'm going to talk mostly about today, that ponds um, would be constructed with temporary flood pools. This is not the case. Interestingly, uh, Northwest Arkansas is home to one of the most dense, densely populated areas for farm ponds in, in the world, in fact, certainly in the United States. Um, but none of those ponds, very few of those ponds, actually have a true flood storage design. And so the way we built the model was assuming that we could build ponds with a flood storage design and that the average water residence time of that flood pool would be at least seven days. Um, so if we make those assumptions on our model, that was the output that we got for the West Fork of the White River. So we really wanted, so we came, Beaver Water, or Beaver Watershed Alliance came to us 
a, a year or two later and said, we want to do a demonstration project to sort of quantify these assumptions a little bit better. And that's what we've been working on ever, ever since. So the way to do this in a traditional pond construction design is whenever you have an inflow, the pond fills up to um, the, the, the high, the maximum height that it can fill up. And if it's wet enough in any given year, Anytime there's a rain event, the outflow of the pond is equal to the inflow. It retains a little bit of water, but it's, it's largely losing water at the same rate it's, it's gaining water, at least on an average annual basis. Now, if you modify a pond to have an intentional flood pool structure, just like, by the way, or very analogous to the way the US Army Corps of Engineers has a flood pool for many of their large lakes and reservoirs, um, then it gives us a little bit more flexibility on storing water temporarily. Um, so this is a, just a, a simple design with its use all over the world for this, these types of ponds and certainly in urban settings it's oftentimes used where we just have a stand pipe with a perforated uh, pipe that drains water slowly as it fills up. So you can imagine this whenever water enters the pond really rapidly on an event, uh, what happens is the pond elevation, uh, the, the surface water elevation of the pond goes up um, it's come, water's coming into the pond more rapidly than it can leave through the standpipe, and so therefore it slowly uh, drains back out. And we can try to design the standpipe in a way where we can control the hydrology based on the time, the drainage time that we, that we really want. And there's been a lot of published studies uh, working on that concept. So we wanted to take this concept and apply it on a farm, and we did uh, so a lot of background work with the Alliance to identify a farm that we thought would be the most conducive to what we wanted to try. And we landed on this farm, uh, Scott Mackey's farm in the, in the West Fork uh, uh, watershed um, on a major, on uh, uh, the uh, Rock Creek uh, tributary of the watershed. And what you see here is the property line for one of his pieces of property. He actually owns, has more property on his farm than this, but this is uh, the one where we actually put the pond. And what you're seeing, here's a couple of uh, abandoned um, turkey, uh, uh, turkey buildings where they used to raise turkeys um, and several pastures where they still have cow-calf operations. And what we did was identify three locations on his farm where we wanted to install uh, uh, flumes to help us mo monitor flow off the watershed um, for, a, for a brief period of time and then come back and and actually build a pond, construct a pond in between these flumes so that we could see the effect of the pond on, on the farm hydrology. So uh, working with Scott, the landowner there, who by the way was really terrific to work with, um, uh, we went to his farm and installed flumes in all three of these locations back in the spring of 2018. Uh, here's one of the, here's the site, the lower site where we um, installed a flume. This is what it looked like prior to any work that we did. Scott was a big help, mainly he drove the tractor and did all the dirt work because I was a city boy and didn't know what I was doing. And he, would, he didn't laugh at me too much for not knowing that. Um, but there he is, uh, there's, there's Scott helping out with uh, getting these flumes installed and getting them level so we can use them. So there's this site just looking upstream and you can kind of see the pasture landscape in the background um, that, that this mainly drains this uh, landscape. Um, and there's the flume in action, one of the first storm events that we captured. And what basically we do here is with these flumes, we all we have to do is measure the water depth in the flume. So we put sensors into the flumes that measure the pressure and give us water depth. And from that, we can compute the flow. So here's just the period of record for that, this particular site, this lower site um, that we collected data for, water depth for the entire period of record for, for the project, just to give you a sense of how much data we're talking about. So for um, about two and a half years now, we've been collecting water depth data in all three of these flumes on a five minute interval. And we convert those five minute interval data into flow data. And we also collect water quality samples from the flumes to get sediment and nutrient concentrations as well. So uh, after we had about a year and a half worth of flow data pre-pond, we went and built the pond in the summer of 2019. So you see the pond under construction in the picture photograph on the left here, and the, a, a photograph I took just a few weeks ago of the pond um, uh, really recently. Uh, notice in the background, there's this, here's our standpipe. So this is the, this is our flood control structure within the pond. The pond has an emergency overflow. If it gets over the top of the standpipe, it actually will go around the side, water will go around the side and, and drain through an emergency spillway as well. But our hope is that we can keep 
an active flood pool in this in this pond um, that um, over about the over about the depth of about a one meter basis in the pond. So if the pond fills up in a storm event completely all the way through to the top of the flood pool. What we found was it takes about, um, on average, the water residence time of that water in the pond is just slightly less than 10 days. And we found that with this, these data that you're seeing here, um, there's a, a, a really strong relationship that we can plot and we can be very confident in, in replicating this. So if the pond fills up only to partial volumes, we, we know how much time it will take for the water uh, to, slowly, to slowly leak out. So here's the period of record of data. Um, at least through um, the middle part of the summer here, um, all of the flow events for all three flumes that you're seeing. And notice in the pre-pond data that most of the peaked flows that you see are this blue in the lower side. So the lower side has the highest flow of all three flumes that we monitored for the most part. But then we built the pond here in July of 2019 and notice afterwards that almost always this upper field site actually has the greatest peak flow observed on the on the farm. So that means the, the, the pond is really doing its job really well. It's holding water and slowly leaking it out, contributing to base flow rather than contributing to peak flow. So you might recall, if we want to compare these things scientifically, we really need to have a way to compare the pre and post pond. So the way we did that um, was we made the assumption that the water flowing from uh, the flumes in locations C and B always contributed to, to flume A. But there were some other areas in the watershed that we had ungauged. So we knew that the flow in flume A was always going to be greater, at least in the pre-pond scenario, than the flow in flumes B and C. Um, so in order to quantify that, what we wanted to do with the pre-pond data was develop a relationship between the amount of peak flow in the lower side. So these are this is the peak flow at site A represented on the x-axis down here. And then on the y-axis, we have the combined peak flow of flumes B and C. And you see this really strong relationship between the two. Again, this is for the pre-pond data. And so this allows us to use a linear regression analysis, uh, come up with a prediction line. And now for all of the post-pond data, we can actually have a predicted value for what the flow would be like if the pond was not there. So that's how we did our comparison. So if you look at this graph, what you're seeing on the x-axis is the amount of flow that would have been expected in the lower flume if there would not be a pres pond present in the landscape. And on the y-axis, what you're seeing is the actual lower site flow data after the pond was present in the landscape. So if our data fall above this one-to-one -one line, our peak flow would be higher than we predicted. If it was right on the one-to-one -one line, it would be exactly the same as if there was no pond in that there before. And if it was lower than this line, then the peak flow would be less than what we predicted, which is what we hypothesized would actually happen. And indeed, that's exactly what, what we found. That as you, after we put the pond in the landscape, we on average had about a 1,500 gallon per minute reduction in peak flow across all our events averaged, at least. So that was good news. Um, the initial not so great news was that the, we also were measuring sediment and nutrient concentrations in the upstream and downstream flumes. And, we, and with the data that we have so far, we cannot find a statistical difference in the amount of sediment and nutrient that's being stored in the pond. that are leaving, that are coming through the upper flumes and leaving the lower flume. Um, and however, I think there's a really specific reason for that. It's kind of twofold. One, we disturbed the landscape pretty significantly when we built the pond, and I think it's just going to take time for the pond to sort of uh, equalize uh, um, in regard to retaining sediment and nutrients. And then the other thing, uh, the landowner here was interested in some landscape changes whenever we built the pond, and he, he went ahead and executed those in the watershed above the pond immediately after we built the pond. And that wasn't ideal for our study, but it's his land, and uh, and it's and so it made sense for us to support him no matter what he what he wanted to do. So th I think that affected uh, the the data that we're collecting right now, and we don't see a, an increase or a decrease. It's just really no difference in the amount of sediment and nutrient leaving the farm at this point. What I wanted to point out with this photograph, though, is this was a photograph that was taking taken. taken um, 
The upper photograph was one that was taken uh, uh, last year, as soon as the pond filled up, so late summer, early fall 2019. And again, this is a photograph that I just took a couple of weeks ago. And you can really see a big, start to see a big difference. So we are gonna be continuing to monitor uh, this system for the next year. And I think we're actually gonna see some pretty large reductions in sediment and nutrient transport in the next year, just because uh, the pond is settling in and the landscape has, has, um, has uh, become a bit more stable as well. So next steps, we're gonna continue monitoring for another year. Um, one of the goals that we have for this is to use these data to justify sort of in the way uh, Andrew Sharpley was talking about before, how we could, uh, how we could enter farm, uh, farm ponds into sort of a discovery watershed approach. We'd love to quantify this on a bigger scale with multiple farms um, where we have a collective effect of many ponds as opposed to just a single pond and one landscape. And then another, uh, Another set of questions that my lab in particular is interested in is, what's the implication for on-farm water quality? And that's because many of these farmers are used, want to use, want ponds on their property, but they use them to water their livestock. And one issue that we have is if we're trapping nutrients on the farm in ponds, we may be creating eutro really eutrophic ponds that have, are at high risk for harmful algal blooms and could affect the health of the livestock that are being um, watered with them. So I think I've gone over my time, sorry about that. Um, but that's all I have. And uh, I just wanna acknowledge the funding sources we had for this, all the help from lots of different people. And I'll take any questions if I have time. Yeah, Ed, it looks like we got maybe a couple questions here. Um, was the pond also being used as a livestock watering source? Um, it seems like you might have answered that a little bit. I don't know if this current pond is actually being used. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, um, yes, he is. Um, it's, but only, it's, he's popping it out to a different field. So the one thing that he's done for, for us, sort of by request, is for the most part, we're keeping livestock out of the pond right now where they don't physically get into the pond. But he, do, we did, he did set up where he's popping water out of the pond over to a different, over to a watering trough nearby. So he is using it at this point for watering his livestock, just not with them having direct access. Okay, we've also got a question from uh, my colleague, uh, Matt Rich, uh, and he asks, with the up watershed soil disturbance uh, occurring post ponding that you described, what do you think the timeline for pond seeding or equilibrating is, years, months? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm hopeful based on that photograph, uh, based on this photograph, I'm hoping it's, no more than one year. <laughs> I think we're seeing, I mean, I think visually we're starting to see some really big differences in the, what the pond looked like from this time last year to this year. So I think with time, I think we actually will see um, the data begin to show that this year, uh, but time will tell. Um, I will, like I said, we continue to monitor the pond for the next, uh, for the next year. And, um, and so we should know this time next year kind of where we stand with that in, regard, in that regard. Is there a range of flood events that the pond was designed for? Yes, that's a great question. So the pond, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna do math on the fly here, which is always dangerous. Um, the pond is a little less than an acre in size. It's about a, a 0.6 acres surface area um, at the conservation pool. And the, um, uh, the, the, uh, a flood pool is about two feet, um, so they, whatever that is, two, two times uh, uh, 0.6, 1.2 acre feet of flood storage for this particular location. Um, now, the, when it's filled to the absolute top of that flood storage, the first um, probably you know, 20 to 50 percent of the, of the volume is lost relatively rapidly, but the last 50% is slowed down exponentially. And, and it takes a relatively big event to generate that much water in this small of an area. I think the watershed area above the pond is about, is less than 20 acres. So we're talking about generating an acre foot of water on 20 acres. It takes a relatively large rain event to do that. Um, would more shallow, like the shallower areas of the ponds be, uh... Would it be useful to have, you know, plants in there uh, to increase water quality? Absolutely. Well, I think it depends on your goal. I mean, clearly, aquatic vegetation has been shown to 
um, reduce the velocity, um, just the circulation velocity of a pond. And so it will help, it, that would definitely help settle out solids, uh, such suspended sediments in a, in a good way. But I mean, the other problem is just access. It depends on, I mean, these are multi-use ponds. So if a farmer wants to access them, have their cattle access them directly, or um, wants to access them for recreation or for some other purpose, having aquatic vegetation around the edges, is, it can be challenging for those other um, outcomes. So I think from a water quality perspective, absolutely, aquatic vegetation is really terrific. Um, but from, a, from other management perspectives, it can, it can present some challenges. All right, just a couple more questions. A lot of people interested in this topic. So did you use the acres of drainage for each pond to determine the length and diameter of your riser on your water control structure? So in the model, we did that. Well, sort of. We sort of faked that in the model. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Mackey farm pond, that's exactly what we did. We designed the flood storage based on how much watershed area was there. And the, you know we used information about normal precipitation patterns and how much water we expected to move through that landscape to, to design the flood, the flood pool volume. And that's absolutely what you would want to do going forward with this type of management practice. Um, in the model, we also did that, but we sort of did it in a backwards way by just making the pond size and therefore the flood volume proportional to the, to the, um, to the landscape that we were placing the pond in. Now, I will, so I will say, perhaps moving forward, one of the most exciting things about this best management practice is, I mentioned earlier that, that Northwest Arkansas is already a location where there are lots of ponds in the landscape. And here in this particular experiment, we built a new pond, but actually I think maybe the best way to implement this best management practice could be to go to existing ponds in the landscape and just retrofit them with um, an outflow structure that gives them a gives them a flood pool, and if we could do that, you know, for you know dozens of ponds, dozens to many dozens of ponds in a in a watershed, I think we'll start seeing a real water quality benefit acro across the board without the disturbance that we caused in this particular case by just really modifying uh, the farm landscape. So. Uh you know, you, you mentioned that it, at least with this pond in particular, there wasn't any statistical difference between pre and post sediment and nutrients. But I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more about, you know, if we have a bunch of these ponds collectively, what do you think that will do for in-stream water quality as far as, you know, reducing the energy and intensity of storms, you know, and that effect on, on say, uh, you know, bank disturbance? Yeah. So what, what we've already shown here is that it, the, the peak flow reduction is, can be really substantial. So if we can create flood storage, like the model showed in the early part of this presentation, um, we can certainly reduce peak flow on a, on a relatively large scale. And reducing peak flow is sort of the critical component, um, in addition maybe to, to stream bank restoration, reducing peak flow is the critical component to reducing erosion of the river channel itself, for absolutely. And so we're gonna reduce sediment and nutrient inputs from that are caused by stream bank erosion by doing that. But I also think, I also feel really strongly that um, we are also just going to, at the edge of field, we're going to capture nutrients and sediments on, from individual farms and also reduce uh, the, the, the contribution of those locations to uh, river nutrient nutrients and sediment entering the rivers and lakes eventually. So although we haven't been able to show that with this study yet, I think it's just a matter of time um, before we actually will show, show that trend. And, and I think if we can, instead of building new ponds, if we retrofit existing ponds, I think we'll see an effect much faster because we will have uh, basically introduced less disturbance to the ponds in the landscape. Well, I think that's all the questions we've got time for right now. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to uh, Dr. Haggard and Dr. Scott for your excellent presentation, very informative. And I'm going to turn it back over to Becky, who I believe is going to wrap up the program for us this morning. Yes. Yes, thank you to everybody, again, uh, for all of our attendees. And um, 
we are a little past 11, um, so we understand if you need to go today, uh, but we did want to stick around for just a minute. Um, and we do have a short little trailer video of the pond project. So, um, but we'll go ahead and um, announce the last three gift card winners. Uh, Amanda Swope, Bradley Stewart, and Tiffany Mallard. Um, again, your gift cards will be sent um, in an e to the email that you registered with. And um, uh, this whole symposium is also going to be, uh, this has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our Alliance YouTube channel. So we do encourage you to check that out as well as our website, www.beaverwatershedalliance.org. Um, so uh, with that, we'll go ahead and officially in the program, uh, but we're going to stick around for a few minutes after here. And um, Dad, if you want me to pull up the video, uh, every, the the drone footage, we can show sure. that. Does that work for you? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. And then you could just kind of walk us through this. That showing up for you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, so this 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 video just kind of shows the um, landscape that the pond is sitting in, and I think it may show some highlights about um, uh, some of our monitoring locations. You can kind of see in the top left corner one of the flumes um, that drain is right on the edge of the forest there. Um, so yeah, the, these are the two turkey houses that are sort of abandoned use for storage now in our pond on the far on the far left there in the landscape drains about half pasture and about half forest which is one aspect of the study we were really interested in um, so you can see there's a pretty typical ozark landscape a lot of forest on the mountaintops here um, but sort of interspersed with pastures throughout again this is looking back on our pond and, and the matke farm back in 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 the background there And you can notice, I don't know if it'll show it, but there are actually other ponds in the landscape whenever you're flying at a pretty high altitude, you can see some of them actually. So ponds are pretty, are, are, are pretty ubiquitous in the landscape. This is a nice shot coming out and showing, this is, this is actually how he has his uh, drainage pot installed into the pond. So he's actually how he's watering his cows is with a pipe that's entering the bottom of the pond um, right there. And now we're flying over to sort of the forest line. Um, by the way, uh, the folks that helped with the drone footage was really terrific. There's a flume that's uh, that's the up what we call the upper forest flume, and this one would have been uh, site B. Um, that's mainly the straining 100% forest, by the way. Um, and we have what you know two and a half years of, of flow and water quality data coming off of that forest at the edge of field um, right right now. The pond was really low when we saw, shot this drain footage. You could see, you could see the conservation pool. Like it's the, normally the conservation pool would be the, bo the bottom of those perforations in the pot. Um, but it's at the end of the summer, it had been pretty dry in Northwest Arkansas. And so water does actually seep through the dam. It's wet on the downhill side of the dam. Um, and so given enough time, we, can, we definitely can get below our conservation pool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Thad. And yeah. um, we do have an actual 10 minute video. Um, we'll send you all a link to that uh, to our YouTube channel. But otherwise, um, if there's any other questions or comments uh, from any of the panelists, moderators, or attendees, um, looks like we do have one question that came in. Uh, oh, Thad, I think this was for you. Um, use of a livestock watering system, uh, but it's broke, do cattle water, something. <laughs> Is there a difference in using the watering system? Uh, let me see, I'm trying to find the question. I, I don't, um, I think, the, yeah, I, th I think the watering system is just a way to keep his cows behind a separate fence and then still provide the water from the pond to them without them entering the pond directly. I think one of the thing that we one thing we definitely know 
from the literature is that when livestock access the wa a water body specifically for to, for to drink or to cool off, they, they will, <laughs> and they can have a pretty big effect on the wa on water quality in the, in the water body when they do that. So we've we've intentionally kept the livestock out of these pond this pond in particular, and um, I would definitely recommend that if possible. And so I think that's what that structure is for to to basically use the water but not allow the cows to access the pond directly. Did that answer the question? I hope so. <clears throat> all right well thanks again everybody and um, we'll go ahead and wrap up here and um, please reach out at any time thanks again for joining the 2020 annual beaver lake watershed symposium